When you're done talking, Sorry? when you're done talking, if you can just mute this here. Okay. Um, and, yeah. Ready to go? Okay, I've got the nod to go ahead. Make sure everybody can hear me through this. Not at all. <laughs> should I talk really loud? <laughs> it, it should be recorded. Donalds, I'm a partner at, with KPMG here in the firm, and we're happy to have everybody come and visit today. We've got a great showing. Um, you know, we have been involved uh, with crypto and digital asset space for since 2018. Our, our team has been rapidly growing. We're constantly adding new people, and uh, you know, we appreciate the opportunity to host and learn more because we know the learning curve with crypto is very steep and uh, sometimes volatile. So we're, we're happy to, to have the opportunity to, to learn some more. Um, I'll hand over to the association, uh, Danielle, to, uh, to now say a word or two. Hi, guys. I'm just giving you a warm wel welcome from the Blockchain Association side. I'm um, the newly appointed treasurer of the Blockchain Association and independent director at Hash. Um, we've just newly appointed a steering committee for blockchain to steer the year forward and set our goals. Um, our main goal at this point is to create community. Um, the industry is growing at a rapid pace, specifically for DAOs, um, decentralized autonomous organizations, and crypto funds. So we really want to steer the way and help to grow the community even more and attract big players in the game like we recently did. Um, so we also <laughs> just created new membership structures. So we have corporate structures. And unfortunately, at this point, we don't support any individual memberships. But we do motivate you to join us um, through following our LinkedIn or joining our dis distribution groups on our website. But for the corporate structure, we have service providers, we have industry participants and blockchain entities. So you can fit whatever your needs are in one of those structures. And uh, <laughs> sorry, I just, I'm just trying to remember all the new benefit structures. We have so much benefits for our new members. Our membership fees have just been determined. We emailed the community and hopefully you'll apply with us as well. Some of our main benefits would be, you know, we, you can market throughout the throughout our platforms, our website, our social media. We're giving all our members the opportunity to market through us. We'll distribute your specific articles, things like that. We're giving the community an opportunity to collaborate with us, to, um, create working groups, and you know, identify the pressure points in Cayman and for the industry. So we can tackle it as an industry and collaborate. And then as well as, you know, events, what would be a community without amazing events? So we're planning to create events at least once a month. Um, that's going to be with our members as well as big industry leaders that's coming to visit 
Cayman that wants to see more of our community and service providers. Uh, I think it was about two months ago, Chainalysis was in Cayman. We had an amazingly successful event with them as well. So those and much, much more benefits for our community. We would like to thank the sponsors, KPMG, Stepping Stones, Kirk's ISS, CC, Bucky, and Digital Cayman as well for this amazing event and organizing it for us. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right, thanks very much, Danielle. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Kobus Peterson. I'll be mod the moderator for tonight. Um, and as Danielle just introduced, the topic is decentralized autonomous organizations, DAOs. Hopefully, by the end of tonight, if you don't know what it is yet, you will. At least you will know more. Um, we had initially set out sort of a goal of certain number of attendees we were hoping would show up tonight. Uh, we very quickly sold out of that number, and we've now also been able to add um, live streaming. So welcome to everyone who's streaming from home tonight. Uh, I think what this tells us is that uh, this is a very hot topic at the moment, and we are very fortunate to be joined by an incredible panel tonight. I'm going to be introducing them to you in a second. But I do encourage you to, at the end of tonight, when there's a Q&A session, to ask them your questions. Uh, these really are some of the brightest minds we have in this space at the moment. Uh, so please make, make good use of that. Just to give you a brief outline of, of what tonight's going to look like, um, I'll introduce these guys in a second, and then I'll give them an opportunity to just tell us about themselves. Then we'll get into the, the good stuff, the topics. Um, that will run for about 30 to 40 minutes from now, and we'll have a Q&A session after that. So please keep your questions until then. For those who are streaming from home, uh, there should be a chat box where you can type your questions. Someone is fielding it. Um, so please submit those, and we'll, we'll ask them to the panel at the end. But we should be all wrapped up here in about an hour. Um, we have some drinks and for afterwards, so if there's anything you didn't want to ask here, or if you wanted to meet anyone from the panel, please come down afterwards and come say hi. Um, so by brief introduction, and then I'll give these guys a moment to talk about themselves. Um, starting from the far side there, we are very fortunate actually tonight to be joined by James Knox from, uh, from Aon, he's managing director at Aon, who came down from New York tonight to come speak to us. So thank you very much, James. Um, uh, a pleasure, just for the audience here. Um, my wife and I, if you can hear me, my, my wife and uh, I back Jim. in New York, we live with, uh, we have five children, and I'm living in a home right now with five females, three of which are teenage girls. I can't tell you how much it means to be here right now. <laughs> it's, uh, so thank you for having me. Thank you, guys. Um, next to James, we have someone who actually works in the industry, in the tech side of these DAOs, and I'm very interested to hear tonight from Yaro, who's the managing director for Chainlink. Um, so thank you for being Pleasure here. Pleasure to meet everybody. Yeah. Uh, I don't have four women at home at the moment, only one, but there you go. Um, next to Yara, we have Oliver Bell. Uh, a lot of you in this room probably know this friendly face. Oli uh, used to be a partner at a major law firm on Ireland and is now the founder at Marfire. Uh, welcome, Oli. Uh, and then finally, we have Mark Piano. Mark is actually relatively new on Ireland, only having been here a short few years, but he's very quickly established himself as an authority in the industry. And if we are lucky a little bit later, maybe Mark will share with us a few words on what I understand to be, as far as I'm aware, the first crypto podcast out of the Cayman Islands, which Mark has recently launched. So um, perhaps we can hear a little bit about that later, because this topic is sure to have changed in three months from now. So you might want to hear what Mark has to say at that point. Um, but let me give you guys an opportunity to talk about yourselves. Mark, maybe if you go first, just tell us what you do in DAOs. Uh, <clears throat> depends what day it is. So uh, I'm a, a senior associate at Harney's in the, in the Cayman Islands. And I came here in March 2020 on the day that people had to self-isolate when they arrived on the island, and then 
the whole place locked down while I was in isolation. So that was fun. Seem to have recovered from that, though. So I work with uh, the Harney's funds and regulatory team, do a whole bunch of stuff, including investment funds. And then because I'm a tech geek who became a lawyer, I've been into Bitcoin and crypto since about 2012 onwards. And then it turned into a lot of work using the advantages of the Cayman Islands. The Dow element is quite a, uh, I think, brain melting is perhaps the right road area sometimes. But as a jurisdiction, we've got some very, very good people here. We've got a very strong international reputation. And uh, it's a great space to work in. I ended up wanting to do this years ago. And now I'm doing it. Sometimes I have to pinch myself. So that's me. Hello. Can you hear me? Is this on? Yeah. Um, what Jim may not tell you is actually a beekeeper as well, which I find fascinating. So if you're interested in bees, then chat to him later as well. Yeah, five females. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so very quickly, um, great to see all of you here. Thanks for coming. Um, by way of background, I'm a recovering lawyer. So I was um, a partner at Walker's and previously before that, a partner at, uh, at Harney's. Um, I left to set up Marfire, which is a boutique crypto directorship shop on Ireland. Um, we are working primarily in the DAO space, which is fascinating, and, uh, and doing a lot with, uh, with Mark and, well, many of you, many of you here today. Well, uh, I think I'm not going to carry on with the jokes. Well, I'll, I'll leave that to James. Um, but yeah, my name is Yaroslav Chinitsyn, and uh, I'm the managing director for Chainlink. I also come from a legal background, but uh, three years ago, I decided to drop that and go uh, innovate. I guess, because the future is blockchain, Web 3.0. Um, Chainlink is a decentralized um, Oracle provider uh, that provides data for smart contract execution. And we're the number one uh, leader in that space. <clears throat> OK, no jokes. So uh, Jim Knox, managing director at Aon. Again, pleasure to meet you all. Um, help hit up our, our crypto practice blockchain practice, some of my personal clients are the likes of Galaxy Digital, Gemini, Blockchain.com, BlockFi, and a host of others. Um, many DAO clients we're helping right now with their insurance needs. Um, if I can just give, introduce real quick a colleague, um, Ghislaine, could you stand up, please? We're working on captive solutions right now in the space for the DAOs and the funds, so thank you, Ghislaine. And that's it. Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, I think... What we can see is we have the full spectrum here from, from every angle of the, the DAOs, and that's what we're going to try to, to cover here tonight. So I think to start off with, um, Mark, you're the, the lawyer uh, on the panel. Um, maybe can you give us a little bit just what is a DAO, uh, for those who may not know, uh, where does it fit in? And then also Cayman seems to be a very hot spot for that we are inevitably going to be talking about foundation companies, which is um, what these DAO structures use. So maybe why is that such a, such a good and such a popular structure? OK. I'm going to be freewheeling this, so let's see how it goes. A DAO is a concept. It's the idea of a decentralized autonomous organization, or that's what it stands for. The origin of that term is from an article, at least as far as I can tell, and happy to be proven wrong, posted by Vitalik Buterin. Some of you may know he was and is one of the brains behind Ethereum in 2014. And he talks about this idea of a living entity on the internet that is able to make its own decisions, hold and deal with its own assets, but instruct humans to do the things that it can't do. And he distinguishes that from a decentralized agent, a decentralized organization, which is a group of people who roughly loosely organize and then make decisions amongst themselves, and a few other concepts. So the idea of a DAO has, is not new, but the execution of that is now very, very popular for many reasons, which I'm sure other members of the panel can discuss. But my uh, perspective on it has slightly changed in the last few months as we've been working on more of these DAOs and these corporate structures. Why do we need a corporate structure? A DAO doesn't exist in any kind of le recognized legal form. It's a group of people coming together using technology to make decisions on what do they do? What do they invest in? If they hold some assets collectively, then how do they use those assets? So it's a very interesting concept in the sense that it's seen as a thing, 
as an idea, but in practice, it's just a loose group of people who are unincorporated and are associating with each other. So depending on where you are or where the members are, it could be an unincorporated association, like say um, a sports club or a student society at university. If they're in it to make profit, it could potentially be, again, depending on the jurisdiction, a common partnership or some other gr uh, deemed legal arrangement in the aspect, in the absence of them declaring anything to the contrary. They're not incorporating. They're not forming any kind of vehicle which is recognised under a particular jurisdiction. So you have this nebulous kind of concept of people doing things they've been doing for a very long time, coming together with a common idea, whether it's profit or not, and drawing in some assets to do stuff with that. So this concept now has, has taken hold of the mainstream and it's become a colloquial term for this arrangement. My slight issue with it, although I'm slightly tempering it after an article I read just before I came here, hence the freewheeling, is that they're not really that decentralized to begin with, especially if you're using corporate structures. And I'll get on to why corporate structures are used in a minute. They're started by a very small group of people who eventually want to become decentralized, but to actually get anything off the ground, you have to have a very core group of people actually making those initial decisions. And they're not really that autonomous. So they might use technology to communicate with each other and make decisions, but they're not creating something that takes on a life of its own. That's not using the technology to use its own logic to make its own decisions and deal with its own assets. And because of this, a lot of people have difficulty in trying to identify how to interact with a DAO. Do you have someone who fronts the DAO, in which case how decentralized is it? Or do you somehow have an interaction with a legal entity which is recognized and has that standing in law in one jurisdiction, which is then recognized in others, that can then interact with the world? And if that's the case, then can anyone own it? Because if they own it, then surely they're really the ones who benefit from any contracts entered into or any assets which are held. So you have this interesting philosophical argument, but you also have this requirement to have something which is recognized to engage with the world, but for that to be subject to governance rules by this collective organization, whatever those governance rules are. So you need a vehicle, but you can't have any members. So there's a few structures which may work in other jurisdictions. You've got the Marshall Islands trying something. You've got Wyoming trying something. You've got something called limited liability companies in the US, and there's interesting arguments around those. But what appears to have happened in the last few months or years, I was looking at Matt there because we set one up, well, you set one up in 2019, well before I joined. The foundation company, which is not a new concept, but it's a new use of the vehicle. It's not just in Cayman, there's other jurisdictions as well. But in essence, it's a corporate vehicle which has no members. And so if you're a DAO, or if you're a member of a DAO, this is perfect because you can have a legal entity without having to own it, and therefore it's more decentralized, but it can then do things, it can contract, and it can undertake the things which an organized, or in some cases disorganized, group of people can not do on their own or would have to find one of their number to front it and take the potential contractual liability. So this interesting dichotomy between the real world and the decentralized world or the uh, online world is coming together in an interesting hybrid fusion that we haven't normally seen before. We're having a company which is able to take instructions from a governance protocol or some other they're not directors, they're not officers, they're not necessarily members, but they're still able to instruct the company. And we don't necessarily know who they are, and they can change from time to time. So that's why foundation companies are very popular. The Cayman Islands, as a well-recognized and very well-regulated financial services jurisdiction, has a vehicle which works well. And that can then be structured in with uh, subsidiaries and other jurisdictions. It can interact with onshore entities. Um, Sorry, a bit of a dry throat. That's Coca-Cola for you. Uh, we're now seeing a, I'm not going to say market, but a fairly typical structure emerge, which is using foundation companies to be the arm through which the DAO can interact with the world. It's creating some interesting, um, thank you. <laughs> it's creating some interesting legal and regulatory uh, positions. Executing transactions through it is, requires a lot of thought. But what we're seeing now is people really pushing the boundaries between what can these foundation companies do and what can't they do and where's the risk and what's the acceptable risk and who the hell makes these decisions in the first place. 
So it's a very fast emerging area. As Koba said before, if we have this conversation in three months' time, I'll probably have a completely different explanation. But uh, that's, that's, that is in a nutshell. I'd argue that at the moment, there's not that much autonomy and not that much decentralization. So maybe we call them ADOs, aspiring decentralized organizations. I don't know. So earlier I was seeing you uh, making I was just scribbling. Wild, wild notes just there. Just scribbling a lot. Yeah, <laughs> um, um, yeah we are, we are going to free will a little bit. Um, and I think and that's kind of the part of the flow here is that, that particularly with our kind of legal backgrounds, we can chat a bit around that as well. I mean, there are, and, and by the way, this is a safe place for everyone here tonight. If you've got questions, put your hand up, throw things at us. Um, yeah, frankly, at the moment, nobody knows everything. Uh, we all know very little in our silos. Um, anyone who tells you anything different is frankly lying at the moment because this is such a gray area. There is a playbook being written out at the moment as we literally as we speak. I mean, Mark and I were chatting earlier. I was like, actually, that's a really good point. Let's move forward with that later. Um, in terms of, I mean, just a couple of things that Mark mentioned. I mean, there are other jurisdictions that have got the concept of foundation right now. So Panama has got one. Uh, Switzerland was very popular a few years ago, but because of cost, language and frankly it took a long time to get stuff done over there um it didn't really work out very well estonia has got the concept of one as well so there are other jurisdictions that have got foundations but frankly the number one at the moment in the world i feel that at least has the kind of biggest DAOs out there is, is definitely cayman um and the other point i wanted to mention was that you know the reason you need the foundation fundamentally is because no single member of the DAO wants to put their hand up and go okay i'll accept liability for this contract that we're going to enter into for and on behalf of everyone else right now you need that entity there so, that so i mean I, I wanted to expand on that point there Oli. um kind of mark mentioned it and you now touched on it uh, what is, you see these things day in and day out from an operational side from an actual how does it work? Who is the one guy or who so, other people would, how do they get in touch? Yeah, it's a really good point. So as Mark mentioned, these things start off fundamentally from a very centralized position. There is normally, let's say a US labs entity. That's where I'd say 80% of the work that I'm seeing at the moment is coming from North America. Why That'll are they be, called labs? Yeah, it's because uh, it sounds, yeah. It, it's it sounds cool. techie. It's, yeah. It's studio, yeah, it sounds kind of creative, I guess. Um, they, yeah, it could be two, three, four, five, a number of individuals, um, very bright, very techy, know something incredible, very good at coding. Maybe not, maybe they get the coders in themselves. But they set this labs entity up to do something, um, to develop the protocol. At that point, it's incredibly centralized. They then set up this Cayman Foundation and they need to move away from that. And why do they need to do that? They need to do it for two reasons. One, tax fundamentally. And secondly, they need to do it from a regulatory perspective. They want to move away from being in a position where the IRS or the SEC can put a finger on them and go, you are domiciled here in the US and therefore you're subject to Securities Act, the Advisors Act, et cetera, et cetera. So to the extent possible, they set these foundations up over here tax neutral, obviously, but over here where they're outside, hopefully, of the arms of those regulators. Now, we don't know yet whether that is going to provide a, a bulletproof solution. It will certainly help, but we can't guarantee that it will be cast iron. So we're in that position at the beginning. You've got a US labs entity, and then you've got this foundation. So where do we move from there? Well, we need to start bolting on, and this is where I come in as, a, as an independent director, to say, look, these are now the ways that we go to decentralize from a practical perspective. So, and what do we mean by decentralization? We want to end up in a position where the foundation itself is now self-sustaining. It's on its own out here, rather than being supported by the US labs entity, which at the moment is providing everything. It's doing accounting, it'll do your treasury, it'll do your governance, it'll do your grants program. It'll run your bug bounty program. So these are all the things over here that are now in the US that we don't want done in the US. So we now have to start bolting those on in various different ways. I was going to say, this is incredibly complicated. I just want to take a step back and say, why the hell would anyone want to do this? So I think it's a just to set in the background here, it's this libertarian idea that founded Bitcoin in the first place, this idea of decentralization. 
So rather than having a select group of people who are rather wealthy making all the money off these groundbreaking projects, in the ethos of trying to democratize things or trying to bring benefits to people who don't necessarily have the capital to, to start these projects up, you organize something, deploy it out there, and then anyone can take part in it without having to sign subscription agreements or have to comply with you know, share transfer requirements. It's the idea of making finance and the economy and all that sort of stuff more open and accessible to people. So even though I think the end result ends up being quite costly and expensive, the ethos is there in many cases. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes there's other motivations. But I just wanted to kind of set the context because it's, it's quite an undertaking. It is. And, and that's a really good point. It's not a fund. Okay, we know where we are with funds, and funds have been around since, what, the 1940s, 1950s. Um, that is a very, um, we've got to a position with funds, it's a very well-trodden path. You know, we have rules set up by CIMA, how we do that. We've got to have, you know, set number of board meetings a year. We know exactly how that works. We've got checklists, it's all good. As I said, we're in a, a gray area right now, and we are quite literally writing those checklists every day from scratch. Um, so what do we need? We need fundamentally a project manager. We need someone to lead this. We are non-executive directors, so we are not getting involved on a day-to-day -day basis. So we need someone to come in as, for want of a better word, COO. Number one role, we need that to be done in the foundation. That role is incredibly difficult to find. I mean, they are unicorns. First of all, you've got a, an age profile. They've got to have tons of energy. They've got to be prepared, frankly, to work for not great compensation at the very beginning. And you know, frankly as well, it's their neck on the line as well. So there's a risk profile involved and they've got to be incredibly tech savvy. So you're trying to find that individual and they can't be based in the US. So with all that in mind, how do you find that person? You're not going to find one through a headhunter. So normally you find that person through community involvement. It's someone who's incredibly active on Discord, who's there wanting to help. Okay, great. Let's have a chat. Maybe you're the right person to take this project forward. That's number one. The next thing we need is, and Mark, actually, this is an important point, because where you've got a double tier structure, and actually, you may want to talk about whether we need a Cayman entity or it's a Cayman with a BVI subsidiary, different ways of structuring this. Um, but where it is a double tier structure, very soon, we're going to have to file annual accounts in the BVI. So again, from a legal perspective, we're going to need to have um, accounting done. But from my perspective as a director, I want to see monthly accounts. I want to make sure that you know, when we're paying out every month to this labs entity or someone else, that you know, the expenditure, OK, it's 50K a month, 50K. Whoa, it's 200K this month. Why is that happening? What's going on there? That's an unreasonable expense, potentially, that we need to block. So we need to be careful there. Do you want to talk around dual tier structures and anything you want to dip into there? Okay. Uh, can do. So it's the idea of having a foundation company that nobody owns and it supports the DAO. And then because it's a legal entity, it can hold shares in other subsidiaries. And to this point, and that's going to change as you've just highlighted, a lot of people have incorporated entities in the BVI or other jurisdictions to do things that the foundation company either they don't want it to do because they want to separate our risk and functions, or at the moment, and this is again changing as we speak, uh, there isn't necessarily the same level of regulatory uh, legislation and regime as we do in Cayman with the Virtual Asset Service Providers Act in the BVI. But as of last week, the local yeah. financial services regulator in the BVI published its public consultation on introducing a regulatory regime for virtual asset service providers, which I must stress is not all crypto businesses yeah. in the BVI. And they have also amended their AML regulations to bring these same virtual asset service providers into that regime from the 1st of December. Again, not all crypto businesses. So that's popular. There's good reasons to do it. Um, which structure used or it should be used? Well, lawyer answer, it depends. So. That's very popular, um, but you need to look at what exactly is this DAO going to do? Why do they need corporate structures? And the final point I just wanted to make, and I will give way on this, I'm apologies, I'm hogging the mic a bit. Yeah. Nice up. Great. Talk, have... Not sure if that's a good or a bad thing. The other thing to take into account is all of this corporate stuff we're talking about and the day-to-day -day transactional elements are completely separate to how this group of people as a DAO organize and govern themselves. And the stru corporate structure can be set up to take instructions on that basis from this group of people. It's usually by online ideas or votes or proposals that get passed. And then that's a 
instruction from the DAO. But there's a wider issue around the DAO itself as to how they organize what their bylaws are and what their governance is, completely separate to the corporate and K-Man and BVI legal and regulatory issues. And that is a very much an emerging area and probably going to be one where there's going to be quite a bit of urgency in the coming months, I imagine. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of add to that as well. Great. Thanks. So we've got project lead, number one. We've got an accounting side to it, so outsourced CFO. Uh, Treasury, we're now sitting on 100, 200, 300 million dollars of USDC right now in this vehicle, in this foundation. Per so per DAO. So what do we do with that? We've got two angles. First of all, there's a security angle. And secondly, there's a maintenance of capital angle. So we need someone to actually potentially put that to work. Someone's got to go and invest it maybe. Do they invest it in other DAOs? Do they have invested in a fund? Now, funny enough, there are now fund managers setting up with the sole mandate of investing DAO capital because they know that there's a lot of DAO capital out there floating around, and they know that, frankly, they, they could have a very conservative um, approach um, that just maintains the principle, and that would be potentially good enough as long as it beats inflation right now. Or they invest in DAOs. Or they invest in DAOs themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then we come down to the security angle. And again, there's a question whether that we use something like Gnosis. Now, I don't know if uh, maybe most of you, some of you have heard of a Gnosis safe. Um, Gnosis is where you can use the Gnosis platform to set up a wallet, which then it's has... It's a multi-sig. It's a multi-sig wallet, yeah. Um, in fact... Yeah, so... Yeah, go for a, it. M of yeah. N concept, so basically multiple people for security reasons have access to the wallet, but in order to make a transfer, uh, you have to have three or five, for example, uh, in order for the transfer to actually take place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah and, so I'll just jump in, obviously. That way we'll smoothly sort of branch over to us. Course. But you yeah, can yeah. carry on. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of things I'm going to dispute with no, things great, you said, great, but then great. I don't want to actually burst your bubble either. But continue. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and then, so do you use Gnosis? In which case, we need policies and procedures around that. You know, a lot of DAOs that we work on, they go, oh, we've got a friend who could be the signer here. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Right. Okay. So, I like what, the shard you know, principle as well. I don't know. You could talk about no, that. You, you do that uh, later. That's great. Yep. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, now we build in something in the last couple of months we built in, which is brand new, is the concept of a multi-sig signer agreement. Now, that binds these signers now to the policies and procedures of signing, which we didn't even have six months ago. Um, or do you use a centralized custodian such as Copper or Anchorage? Now, there's a philosophical debate there. Do you use the centralized approach where it's a single point of attack, which could be hacked and fail? Or do you put it on Gnosis where you've got potentially seven different individuals based around the world who don't know each other, but if they got together, they could take the whole thing um, themselves. So you have to be very careful. Um, next thing, protocol governance. Who is running that side for you? Who's running the voting? Um, that's critical. Yeah? So you need someone to run the voting platform. Um, you've got someone, got to have someone to, to run that Discord thread to, to look at your Twitter feeds. Now, again, there are people on Ireland that can help with that, which is great. We're in this stage now where there's this nascent industry being built up here in Cayman. And, and there are now service providers who are plugging all of these gaps that I'm mentioning. Who's going to run your grants program? That's a key point as well. Um, you know, we're going to be giving potentially from foundations USDC or native tokens to people who are going to be applying to us all the time saying, please, can I have some of this because I'm going to build it on your protocol. So we need to monitor that. And who's going to monitor it? We potentially need a team. And then finally, you've got your security audits and your bug bounties as well. So you know, we're seeing that if you don't have a minimum of two audits done, then you're exposed potentially to some form of, of negligent action if you get hacked. What's the security audit and what's the bug bounty? Great question. OK, so you've got this piece of code. And by the way, I'm not technical. Um, that's not my background, but I'm just having a bit of a baptism of fire over the last year and a half and, and learning a lot. Why don't, um, maybe why I don't I'll have yeah, 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 like, so, it. So yeah. from a bug bounty perspective, if uh, obviously um, there's, let's say there's a bounty always out in the wild that if there's an issue with the code and somebody finds that, that person, well, not the hacker, but uh, it's a white hat hacker, you could call him, actually receives that bounty, but he has to reach out to the, the project. In this case, I guess it would be a DAO. Um, and then that's why, for example, you have events like hackathons as well, where like great minds come together and they hack the code to see if it's actually secure as, uh, you know, as the project says that it is. I, I love the concept of bug bounties because it's kind of a bit like the Wild West. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a great website called Immunify. Um, and you can go on there 
and you can see all the bug bounties and they rank them in terms of value. And it's, you know, some of them $10 million for hacking this protocol. Um, and you'll get people deliberately trying to attack the code to see what they can do and see if they can get a hole in it. Um, hopefully my children will do that in the next couple of years and be but, some but of hackers. But, yeah, but right. it's, good, yeah. it's good for the project if uh, they're not hacked. So, you know, yeah, so, be and that's why they will pay them yeah. so much money. Exactly. Um, well, seeing as we're coming into the tech side, uh, let's, you're, let's, you're let's segue over naturally. Yeah, yeah you're so naturally yeah. dropping yeah. in. Yeah. These gents have covered everything. Tell us, uh, well, well, the, tell us about the under the hood. Like, uh, uh, you well, I guess uh, Chainlink uh, from the perspective of price feeds of what we provide for a lot of DAOs, if it's to do with bit DAOs, uh, which is an investment uh, venture far, firm, you guess, like DAO concept. Um, like we provide a lot of products for DAOs, but we don't really specialize in them. But I can tell you about the different concept of DAOs. And as uh, Oliver has mentioned, uh, you know, the, the prot protocol layer, uh, investment layer, uh, there are cause-based DAOs as well, which are more for philanthropy and uh, like social, social good, public good. Uh, the, the list goes on and you could layer it obviously on top of each other. Um, but uh, as examples of uh, very prominent DAOs, you have a stable uh, governance uh, maker DAO, which, which you probably, if you've been to a talk earlier this year, uh, there's a head of, uh, head of I think, uh, engineering was there for, for that. Anyway, um, then you have lending protocols like Aave. Uh, most of you uh, the are in the space probably used it perhaps. Um, then obviously you have BitDAO, which is an investment DAO. Uh, I mean, the list, the list obviously goes on, but I feel like obviously uh, taking time into account, uh, one of the stories I like to tell, especially is quite actual at the moment because there was a recent merge of Ethereum. And uh, many years ago in uh, 20, 2016, the first DAO, which is the Genesis DAO, and they called it the DAO, um, when the first concept well, first time the concept actually came about, where there was, I think, about $150 million worth of ETH um, there until it was hacked. And uh, the team behind it arranged the counter hacking team to, to hack, uh, you know, the black hat hackers, you could call it in that sense. And uh, $70 million was recovered. But um, as a result of that, there was a key, a key situation where there was a hard fork where you probably heard of Ethereum, but you may or may have not heard of Ethereum Classic. And that's when, uh, in order to continue the code and I guess uh, to regain the funds of those people that put the money in the DAO, the Ethereum uh, uh, did a hard fork and continued a different route of the blockchain, whereas Ethereum Classic uh, stayed on the same path. And the reason I say that is because James Knox next to me, uh, you know, he's from Aon and it offers insurance for, for DAOs. And I feel like it's quite a good use case to understand how insurance can, can actually be used in that, that instance, for example. Well, aside from that, uh, it's a very good segue. I kind of would like you to also bring it into some of the stuff that, that Ollie was talking about. Um, I am personally not aware of this, but I've been told that the crypto market doesn't always just go up. I usually, <laughs> usually stick my head in the sand <laughs> when the news comes out. Um, but when things do go bad, there's obviously a lot of opportunities that these guys have discussed. Um, what happens? Uh, can someone be sued? Can Oli be sued if he's a direct? How do you sue a DAO? Uh, could I do that? Yeah, and, great questions. And, and then what? Is there, are there any remedies? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like how they saved me for the doom and gloom parts, but, <laughs> but, but here we are. So there's a disturbing trend with DAOs, and it's the following. Um, we just res recently started to see a number of lawsuits litigation against DAOs, right? Whereas before, it was pretty much non-existent. Large degree is because DAOs just have not been around for a long time. So there's a trend that's developing, and it can be very potentially dangerous for DAO members, DAO founders, investors in DAOs. And it's the following. Typically, traditionally, you know, I'm an attorney, so I feel comfortable speaking to this. If, you, if you're going to bring a lawsuit, you're going to sue a corporation. You're going to sue a board of directors. You may sue the CFO if they're public, the CEO if they're public. That doesn't exist with the DAO. There's no board to sue. There's no legal entity to sue, right? There's no CFOs. So God bless these plaintiff lawyers in the States. They're going to find a way to sue you, and they are. 
And we just recently have had some litigation in states that frankly is disturbing because of the following. In general partnership law, there's a, the a theory that if two or more people come together to form an enterprise that's unincorporated for motive of a profit, that's called general partnership liability. In GPL liability, every member of that group is personally liable and severally. It's called joint and several liability. They're all liable, right? And the disturbing trend right now is that these plaintiffs' lawyers in the states are coming after DAOs and they're suing every member of that DAO. Every member could be potentially liable. They're suing also the founders. They're also suing corporate investors. So it's disturbing because these members of the DAOs could be personally liable for some serious damages. There's a, a DAO called B2K. In May of this year, in California, a lawsuit was brought against this DAO. This DAO was sued because the DAO had told its members, we have phenomenal cybersecurity controls. All right? They didn't. They were hacked for $55 million. Several members of that DAO are now suing the other members, saying, we want our money back. All right? But then the defense lawyers, on the, they put the defense lawyer hat on, they say, well, wait a minute. The guys that are bringing this lawsuit, their members, they're liable as well. So this whole thing's a mess. But um, I just want to say that Aon, literally this week, we just put in place insurance for the first, it's, an industry, it's a first in the industry, we put insurance in place, do you know coverage for founders of a DAO that was unincorporated, right? We just, it took us months to figure out how to do this, but we did it. And I just want to recognize Jill Zukowski. For, Joe, can you stand up, please? All right, thank you, Joe. God bless Joe, he's from Realm Insurance. Realm Insurance has the biggest shoulders in this space for this crypto insurance right now. Captives down the road will be a solution, hopefully, Glane, right? And you're working on that tirelessly, I know. But Realm right now is putting solutions out there, insurance for these members of these DAOs, the founders of the DAOs, where frankly, that was done before. So that, that's, that's that. So going to jump in there. That this is a live issue, and we've got questions with live clients at the moment around DAOs giving indemnities and how they're enforceable, if at all. And this is an ongoing issue. And yes, it is doom and gloom to some extent, but we're going to see in the coming months and years DAO mergers and decisions to bring these entities or groups of people together and very, very significant assets potentially. And there's questions around if you hold tokens and you don't like the decision, do you have a remedy? Um, so. Uh, Cobus was mentioning the podcast before. My last name is Piano, so and it's called Piano Lessons. I didn't come up with the title. Um, and we talk about I gen we we talk about one of the topics is how do you sue a DAO? If it's a group of people who are pseudonymous in some cases, there's now ways to serve court orders through NFTs in some cases by dropping it into the wallet. So we're seeing more and more creative ways, and there's enough value at stake here to make people find ways to get it done. And as you say, it's not a corporation, so it's not as easy. And there's a whole bunch of stuff to consider. But insurance and protection and bylaws at the DAO operational level are becoming very, very important. And you know, it was all a bit unknown a few, a couple of years ago, and people weren't quite sure what to do, and it kind of freewheeled. The autonomy bit, separate to any technical bit, could be we get some rough guidelines in place and people can run it themselves. There's a lot of risk to that. And the more assets they hold, the more incentive there is to find a way to recover that if you're aggrieved. So this is really good news. Well, insurance is going to be very important to the growth of the industry, right? If these founders, if these members can say, here, Joe Zukowski, he's taking the risk. Happy days, right? right? Scale the industry. Thanks, Joe. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> you know, what we haven't had so far is a DAO takeover, actually, not that I'm aware of. It won't be long until you've obviously got at the moment these, these US labs entities, as I mentioned, and foundations. Well, the foundations ultimately have to act on the vote, potentially, of the DAO itself. So what happens in a few years' time when you get a US Labs entity over here who's currently running one DAO that looks over and says, Archie, I think I can run your DAO better, guys, and provide a cheaper, better service to you. They then propose themselves on the vote. The vote goes ahead. And then suddenly you find yourself in a position that you're, as a director, potentially having to terminate that contract with your service entity because you've actually got a DAO which is now voting to move it across. So we've not had that yet. And we're in kind of, that's going to be completely uncharted waters. Consolidation of decentralization. Hmm. One last thing, too, on the insurance part is that I think captives are going to be the ultimate solution because you have all these members of a DAO, right, all going to be seeking insurance. Joe may find a way to provide insurance for each single one of those members, 
but I think that's going to be a lot of due diligence. That's going to be taking time. The solution may be captives down the road, so we'll see. Ollie, if you if you get into a situation like you were just describing, um, that someone says we can come over and can do it better, as a director, do you have any say in that? Do you just follow what the DAO says? It's a really good question. I mean, they wouldn't come to me. They would go straight to the to the vote um, and propose it potentially as a governance vote. Um, a very tricky situation. It's it's almost the same as when, um, and I've not been in this position yet. Um, there are other directors on the ground over here who have, potentially, and um, where suddenly the DAO votes in a way which is potentially illegal, contrary to international law. What do you do then? What do you do if the DAO says, you know what, we want to give a million dollars to Kim Jong-un's wallet because we want to support him in something he's doing? Now, at that point, you know, we as directors on this foundation are in very, very kind of tricky trouble waters. Now, obviously, we wouldn't go ahead with that. Um, for various reasons, but you know, we would have to. I mean, this is why at the moment, actually, and Mark, you can probably jump in on the bylaw side and the MA side. Again, it's evolving, and we're building in potential protections there to say that you know, in terms of votes, it's got to be legal if you're proposing something. But, but um, I think in that instance, as an example, um, Synthetics, which is a product um, out there, also an investment product in the DeFi space. Uh, they use a council, they call it the Spartan Council, exactly. yeah. and it actually solves this whole issue. And also yeah. quadratic voting solves yeah. that as well. So from the technical side, there's actually a lot more uh, levers you can pull, whereas on the legal side, it hasn't really caught up at the same level because from an innovative perspective, the tech, uh, let's say a month in the crypto space is the same as a year in the legal space. And you know, c coming from uh, you know le legal background as well, I understand that for sure. Because e even you know, from an engineering perspective, uh, you know, people are slow, but lawyers sometimes tend to be uh, slower because of the legislator. And that's usually the case, not the lawyers, uh, the legislator, right? Because you've got to have law in order to apply it. Obviously, I, I want to pick up on something Oli said, but um, just for everyone and partly my benefit, yeah, right, what's a quadratic voting mechanism? Um, so, for example, uh, let's say uh, it multiplies the vote that you have in the DAO. So, let's say if you hold five votes, you're at the same level as 25. Uh, it's, it's, the concept is sort of newish, but uh, I mean, I can go into detail, but only on the technical side. Maybe on the legal side, it'll make more sense based on like voting rights, if you're able to explain it from that perspective. Vote waiting. Effectively, like you're, if you have one token or one share, that's worth five votes instead of one vote. So the point I wanted to pick up on, uh, which Ollie made, was the example of a foundation having to do something which could breach law or regulation. Just because you have a corporate structure doesn't mean you've incorporated the DAO and that's it. The DAO is always going to exist through the foundation company or whatever structure you have in place. In many cases, DAOs specifically don't want that for many reasons, partly philosophical, partly because they feel that the governance mechanism wouldn't necessarily work because you then have a blurring of the lines between a vehicle which is at arm's length from the DAO and then a vehicle which is purporting to be the DAO. And there's questions around whether that could work from a legal perspective anyway. So I think what we're talking about here is the idea of the foundation being directed by the DAO and what happens in practice is people put up a proposal. If you hold tokens, depending on the weighting mechanism, you can then vote. And then if enough votes are passed, then the proposal constitutes an instruction. So if the foundation is able to execute on that, and the constitutional documents are set up that way, it theoretically has to do it. But not all DAOs are going to do everything through a foundation company. If the foundation company doesn't have any assets, or doesn't have assets in the name of the DAO, then it's not necessarily going to be able to, to execute on that. It's not going to be the one that does it. So if there are any legal and regulatory issues from that, it may not necessarily touch the corporate structure. It depends. That's the lawyer, yeah, that's the lawyer answer, yeah. <laughs> you questions? Um, before we get into the questions, um, and please, if anyone at home, uh, there's the chat box if you want to put some questions in, in there. Um, just moving away from all the structural things, maybe out of interest, Jim, you were telling me an interesting story the other day about uh, how DAOs are used to acquire interesting assets like sports teams and things like that. Maybe you can share an interesting use case like Sure. I, I th yeah, thanks for that. I mean, DAOs are so much more than buying NFTs or 
DeFi. Um, in, the United, in the United States and the U.S., there's been a movement for DAOs recently to um, become in, involved in very, very large, significant transactions, meaning that a DAO was formed early this year to buy one of the very rare copies of the U.S. Constitution, actual copy of it, right? They were actually outbid by the founder of a tech company in, in, in Silicon Valley, but the DAO came together for that purpose. A DAO was formed, and I'm not sure if they're successful. Joe, I don't know if you know, but the Denver Broncos, a $4 billion franchise in the U.S., football team, a DAO was formed to buy that, that football team. So these DAOs are really taking on some significant investments, endeavors, and it's coming. It's coming in a big way. It's very interesting. It's, uh, it's been a lot of theoretical talk and, and, and things that, that people want to achieve, but it's a very real-world scenario. No, it's, it, personally, it's given me a really um, interesting connection with my children. So those of you who've got kids, um, I don't know if they're, if they're age between you know, 5 and 10, they'll be all over Minecraft and, and, and Roblox, which are two of their favorite games at the moment. And I'm constantly being asked for, you know, oh, Dad, can you give me $5 to buy more Minecoins or Robux? the two native currencies. Now, there's a problem with that because they are locked into those ecosystems permanently. Once the kids are bored of Minecraft, they just go, OK, fine, we'll move away from it. But you can never get that money or those assets ever back again. And when I talk about assets, you know, it's, can we have a new haircut, Dad? Can we have some new trainers? Can we have this, a new skin, shield, gun, whatever it is? So we're working with a really cool DAO, gaming DAO at the moment. Um, in the NFT space. And what they're doing is putting together um, a transferable NFT which allows you to move between gaming ecosystems. So you buy that weapon and then you can take it with you for the rest of your life. So between metaverses, yeah. basically. Between, yeah, between those different games, you can now get a cool pair of shoes, trainers, and you pay for them once and then you can wear them in every game going forward, wherever. And it's brilliant because, I mean, I, I love that as a dad because... Now we won't have to just lose money and throw it down the drain. Um, but it's given me that really cool connection now with the kids as well. And uh, yeah. And, and if anyone is wondering, because I hear this question a lot, what is the metaverse for those who have seen Ready Player One or read the book, that is a metaverse. Um, and that's where Ollie's having to spend his money on <laughs> trainers and haircuts. And it's actually a, a big space. I think that uh, designers are moving I, into I, selling I, handbags. I, I kid and you not. Yeah, I kid you not. Um, uh, it's, it's fascinating. So Gucci, those of you don't know, uh, released a limited edition, uh, uh, I, I don't know how many, what's a thousand pairs of trainers? Something like that. Um, they've gone up probably a thousand fold now. Um, you know, the, uh, <laughs> these are not NFT form. Um, <laughs> well, the, but, the boat that was sold as an NFT for about $750,000 in a in a metaverse of a game as well. That happened when there was the NFT boom. There, there's some crazy things yeah. being and, used and, there. And this generation coming through are living and breathing that, which is fascinating. And that's the world they're growing up in at the moment. It's slightly we terrifying. Haven't. It's slightly terrifying as well, yeah. Um, but it's amazing. I mean, a pair of trainers for them in the metaverse is actually more valuable than a pair of trainers in real life, which they'll scuff within weeks and then in six months' time outgrow. So. Hey, Ali, just for clarification, sure. and mind my ignorance. So when we're talking about trainers, as Yangs call them, sneakers. sneakers. Yeah. But um, in the metaverse, uh, so it's, is it a real one that you'd wear, or we're talking about it, it's, it's you know? No, it's what your character wears. Exactly. Your avatar right, Just so everyone wear. knows this. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's what they would actually wear. And the kids are like, oh, wow, I love your trainers. That's amazing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Facebook, yeah. for example, is, is moving. Facebook is spending a lot of money on research uh, to develop their own metaverse where you're going to have your own avatar. Probably it'll be a little bit too late when Facebook is already going to be dead by that point, but hopefully it's not. <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of unique things that are going to be happening where it seems to be around the world, especially in a lot of, I guess, um, those societies that are more um, individualistic in that sense. Let's say like Japanese people tend to uh, enjoy the metaverse more and uh, having that alternate reality and therefore those are the markets you know they're picking up and, uh, and you know ha having a lot of development in that space I've just got a general question to this entire audience is most of what we're talking about today Greek or, or does everyone have kind of somewhat of an understanding of what we're talking about like even vaguely yeah from philosophy comes from the heart yeah there you go all right because, because I just love to know you know the, the 
the understanding of what we're talking about. And, and you know, is there some remote understanding? That's great. Yeah, that, that's helpful. I, I just want to kind of synthesize because uh, we've been talking about NFTs and the crossover between the real and the virtual. Uh, for anyone who came to the event in February at the cinema, I was talked about NFTs as like a, a magnet, and you can attach stuff to this metallic token. But unless you have metallic force, all those sorry magnetic force, all those attachments will fall off. So you can attach all sorts of things to this token. A lot of people have used digital art. But the idea with this kind of metaverse, real world NFT link is that let's say you buy a luxury fashion item, you will get an NFT which is only created as a one of one in connection with that fashion item. Not only does that allow you to prove that that piece of luxury fashion is genuine and not a knockoff or an imitation, it can then reference a digital asset which represents a physical one in whatever metaverse environment you're going to use. There isn't one metaverse, there's hundreds. Let's see which one wins out. It's a bit VHS and Betamax for those who remember that reference. So you, do are, you are able to use this technology to blend the physical and the virtual. And that gives you a sense of crossover and continuity, whereas before there was a somewhat of a disconnect between the real world and the physical world. NFTs are a bit of a bridge to that. There's all sorts of potential consequences and discussions around that, not for this session. But we're getting to that line now, which is becoming increasingly blurred between what's real and what's not. And NFTs act as a kind of a, a bridge, so to speak, for that. So I just wanted to kind of give you a, how those work together. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think maybe some questions. Is there anyone on at home? No, no questions. Anyone here? Um, can I have a mic? Okay, so I just wanted to thank you guys for sharing that breadth of knowledge today and just say that all the topics you touched on, it was like extremely informative and I guess like for everybody in the room who probably wanted an idea of what is a DAO, these are probably the best four people to discuss it in front of us. Okay, so I just have a question to kind of, um, okay, for half of the panel, which was like the practical legal element, and then we have the technical and the insurance aspect as well. So I think what was not touched on today is that specifically DAOs are just an application of smart contracts, right? It's just a niche way of using them. And essentially, I mean, Chainlink as well being the premier provider of smart contract. Uh, you guys touched on things such as uh, delivering legal documents in NFT form and the such. So to the legal part of it, how f realistically, from your knowledge of your industry, how far do you think that that is going, are we out from that being a like widespread use case, like utilizing that smart contracts, especially, to deliver uh, yeah. in order for the smart legal contracts claims, to be legally binding, basically. Right. And then in regards to the insurance, how far do you think we are from retail interface and products that are essentially autonomous, such that I don't necessarily need to even go to an insurance place to buy a claim or anything like that, and essentially it's all done through my MetaMask wallet as well. And that's it. Yeah. So I, I want to respond to the first part, which was um, where is this going? This you, know, you mentioned NFTs, right? So NFT, non-fungible token, it's created once, all right? This, this is created once, this, this item, this object. So think about what type of things could be created that are used just once. A title to a house, a title to a car, a concert ticket, uh, a restaurant reservation. My sense is that we haven't seen one hundredth of the use of NFTs that are, that are coming. It is so nascent right now. It's so much more than a board ape, you know, crazy thing of art that someone paid 10, 20, 30 million. There's very real practical uses to NFTs, and it's coming. We haven't even seen it yet, but I guarantee you it's going to be part of your future going forward. Like title deeds to property, as you say. Titles, anything that can be used once, right? Yeah, I've often wondered, and this is more of a question for Mark, do you think we'll ever be in a position where we just don't use equity anymore in the, in the legal sense? Um, I had a chat five years ago with Ross Munro, actually, about this. And, um, and, and yeah, we were chatting around whether the concept of an IPO in the future is going to be non-existent. And actually, it's just going to be done through tokens. Um, I think we could find a world in which that happens. Yeah. I think it depends, oh, sorry, yeah, it depends yeah, yeah. on the re regulations there as well. Uh, yeah. Obviously, if the regulations uh, catch up to where there's more stricter, uh, stricter regulatory framework, then it's going to be a lot harder to do ICOs, initial coin offerings. So then the IPOs will still be around. But um, yeah, it r really, it's, it's a good question because um, the grayer the area, 
the quicker the technology will develop. So therefore, the slower the legislator, the better it is for the space in that sense, yeah. yeah. To answer your question. So Ali, a great point about IPOs. So would you say that um, initial coin offerings, did they somewhat replace IPOs or? or yeah, well, I, I guess if you, if you treat a share of a company as the most centralized form of token, <laughs> Right. And then you've got, uh, and, and then subject to hacks and destruction if it's in paper form, et cetera. Whether we'll move eventually to a world which is totally using the blockchain and tokenized form. I, I, th I, don't, I genuinely don't think we're, we're a million miles away from that. No, I, I, no, I, I, I mean, maybe, yeah. I personally, I think less. I think we're definitely heading that direction. Definitely. All right, guys, we've got another question here. Um, yeah, Mark, um, <clears throat> thanks to your comments before just about the aspiring digital autonomous organizations were good. Um, ADO, yeah, ADO, so I just thought they were really good. And I just the thought, A and the D around. Um, as somewhat of a Bitcoin maximalist, and, and I guess Bitcoin being the kind of ultimate uh, digital autonomous organization, do you kind of see, and I don't want you to pump any projects, but um, do you see anything even remotely close as decentralized as Bitcoin in a DAO or close to a DAO format? Because Bitcoin, as we know, is you know the most decentralized project as, as, as far as I'm concerned, and nothing even comes close. I'm going to make a very quick response to the discussion there and then come back to that, because that also gives me time to think on your question while I'm answering that one. <clears throat> so... Uh, well, I think we have to be careful of technology predictions to change the world in a very short amount of time. Back in the 80s and 90s, people thought accounting software was going to replace accountants and the spreadsheet was going to make um, a lot of ledger work redundant. It can enhance, it can sometimes create its own set of problems. I think when we talk about IPOs and uh, tokens replacing equity, we have to take into account the existing constraints of company law. If shares aren't freely transferable, so it depends on what we mean by what this looks like. Is this uh, a token with transfer restrictions? You also got to take into account the AML regulations on that as well. A whole bunch of other issues around securities laws. I sometimes describe what I do as being a professional weaver because I seem to thread needles for a living. And so you have to take that into account with this sort of stuff. So it's very easy to make wide uh, sweeping technology predictions and how it's going to revolutionize everything, but that's been going on for decades. So let's see. I'm, I'm not cynical, but I'm, I'm looking to history as some examples of how grand predictions don't always uh, pan out. Final comment, smart contracts and other smart snore contracts. So there, a lot of people think smart contracts are automatically having legal effect. They can do, depending on, on the terms on which they're programmed, but they're often a vehicle through which execution of transactions can occur. So I think it's a terminology point we have to be careful of. Right, sorry, Dan, going back to your point. Bitcoin um, is the only technology we know of, and we, we can't identify, despite what some people claim, who deployed it. There's all sorts of theories, but we don't know. Um, Tornado Cash could be one of the biggest decentralized organizations now. I don't know. Don't don't quote me on that up there. Well, we know who did it, but it's it's truly decentralized now. When you look at the process they went through, there's a whole group of other projects which kind of are. But I think uh, it's a process, and it really depends on how long they've been there for, what their end goal is, and and the means to get there. Yeah, right. Do you see any challengers? Well, to, to be honest, uh, it's, it's the human factor that's probably going to be the downfall of this space. If we don't move towards, to an extent, artificial intelligence, there's always going to be this greed factor where it's going to be more or less centralized. Yes, Bitcoin, well, you could claim, obviously, that it's fully decentralized, but then, um, you know, you could argue that whales that hold a lot of value have actually more um, say in, than those people that hold smaller smaller units of Bitcoin. So like, it really depends on the philosophy there. Um, but, but I feel like if human nature isn't going to change, um, you know, we're not going to get the ultimate decentralization sort of euphoric state of a project. I don't know, I, maybe I'm just being cynical, but I, I think working in the space, I see it on a daily basis. Fair enough. I think another um, issue that's going to have to be dealt with soon is the SEC in the States has said that a number of tokens issued by different DAOs are, in fact, securities, all right? 
that's going to bring them in the purview of the SEC, which has its whole host of requirements and, and regulatory compliance. That's something that's going to have to be dealt with, you know, as this, as this industry matures as well. Yeah, I think that's that's the one thing. Stay away from the United States. <laughs> if 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 uh, your token is uh, traded and there's a pay, USD pair, do do make sure that doesn't happen. Anything to do with the USD dollar, and then you'll be living pretty bliss. I think you know. <laughs> You have an ICO in the Cayman Islands or in the BVI and then uh, structure it that way. But as long as you don't have UBOs in the US as well. So that's that's another factor. All right. Not not legal advice. Uh, <laughs> Thank, Ed, what are you? Thank you. Um, I'd like to touch on the gloom and doom scenario. It was interesting to hear about the uh, suing of uh, DAO members. What would happen if that DAO had created a foundation company here and Oliver and I were directors on that foundation company? What would be our risk and would be we would be, be, be sued at the same time? What what is the scenario there? Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. So the big question there is jurisdiction. The court has to have jurisdiction over the people that are being sued. The people that are bringing the suit have to have jurisdiction. And for that reason, I think that's why Cayman is becoming very popular. Very simple. Right, lack of jurisdiction. These foundations are being created here. The long arm of Uncle Sam is not coming over here. So, uh, and yeah. even with the vast block, sorry, even with the vast, the virtual asset service provided. Right. So, um, again, it goes back to jurisdiction. I mean, yeah, maybe you got it. You want to first? No, no, no. You Say so if you want to sue a foundation company, it depends why, and not just jurisdiction, but also standing. Are you, do you have a contract with the foundation? Do you have some sort of link there which allows you to, to make that claim? Or If you're looking to sue the foundation, what are you hoping to get out of it? Does it have assets? Does it have any ability to pay any claim? Or are you trying to use a foundation company to get to the members of a DAO? So it, sorry, I keep coming, coming back to this. It depends. <laughs> Ghislaine? Um, I think you answered my question here, yeah, but I was going to ask, are DAOs currently under the purview of VASP? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> if, they're doing, if they're doing things which cause them to fall under existing Cayman law regulation, they're a corporate entity. So if they fall within regulated activities, sorry, let me start that again. If they're undertaking regulated activities, they may well be subject to regular law and regulation, whether like it's security tokens act, too public or something like that. Yeah, VASP Act, um, all sorts of other acts we look at in our legal and regulatory analysis on these. So we need to understand not just if we're setting them up, but if we're advising them, what exactly is the foundation going to do? And depending on that, we can then look at whether they can do it whether they can do it through the foundation or some other way, and whether any laws and regulations apply, and what they need to do next. And that's one of the first things we do as directors, is we make sure that we've got a legal regulatory memorandum which sets out, are you subject to VASP fundamentally, mutual funds law, economic substance, beneficial ownership, la 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 la, yeah. AML, yeah. you know, the whole kind of the full acronym suite. Um, oh yeah, we, we, can, we can do the acronyms. Any and a VASP. Yes. I don't know how many at the moment. I mean, only in Cayman? No, I think it's more now. It's, it's, there's there's a lot of 50, foundation yeah. companies, yeah. like several hundred. Yeah, yeah, VASPs. VASPs uh, 14, 14, apparently. So uh, let's go with that. <laughs> OK, so there's good precedence, at least with SEMA, on that. When you're onboarding, sorry, when you're onboarding. So can, can you use the microphone, then the streamers can hear. So when this all starts for you and the client comes to you and they're talking about setting up a foundation, who is your client? How are you onboarding the DAO? As in who are you determining who you're doing all your AML, KYC and all that fun stuff with? It goes back to what we've discussed before. You normally have a small group of people who set this whole thing up. And so we normally look to them to get things up and running. And then after that, we look at what they want to do and who they want us to act for in future, and we assess it on a case-by-case -case basis. And obviously, as most of the people here, service providers, the registered office is acting as a foundation, company secretary. They obviously have much stricter requirements. Mm -hmm. They have to kind of determine who they're going to 
Well, I think, I think a lot of the service providers involved in this has various regulatory obligations under different laws. And this is sometimes a communications point with the client, that we have our own professional obligations, and so we have a process to go through to get comfortable with that, or maybe some additional information is needed. So as long as they're aware that you're dealing with licensed service providers who have their own obligations and we can work together on that, then we can find a way forward. But no, the, the, the DAO element or the decentralized element, if you want professional service providers, you have to play by their rules to get this up and running. I think that's what you were saying in the beginning, Mark, is that it's not all that decentralized because you have someone who reaches out on not day one and no. says, I want to start this, and that would typically be, I guess, your client that you onboard as a as a corporate service provider. Exactly. So and then, then you'll move towards a DAO, like Ali was describing. Who, who would a regulator or OFAC, for example, go after if there's a sanctions breach or a regulatory breach? But it's not just AML. So I wasn't looking at you, but... Um. No, it's, not, it's not just AML, actually. It goes further than that. So mm -hmm. for any service providers here, uh, I would highly recommend doing deep dive in terms yep. of going on Discord, really understanding what they do. Yeah. Because yeah, I'm, very, I'm very lucky. My chief risk officer is in the audience, and he does incredibly good deep dive on everything we work on and undercovers all sorts of stuff, market manipulation, things that we reputationally don't want to get involved with. And from that reason, it's got nothing to do with AML. It's actually more a kind of reputational, no, that's not good for us or the industry. So or, or the jurisdiction. Or the jurisdiction. It's, it's, yeah. not, it's not just yeah. who, who are our clients. It's what are they doing and why. Yep. Ali, since I've been on the island, I've heard about a, an outfit called Providence. Um, could you explain that a bit, what that's all about? I can, yeah. It's a, it's a bit of self-promotion, I guess. Um, there's, there's a few of us in the audience that are, are founders of Providence, which is a boutique crypto compliance shop on island. Um, and... Exactly. So we assist um, crypto entities, so funds, crypto funds, um, DAOs and their foundations in terms of making sure that anything that comes into them, so either investors coming in or anything that's going out on the investment side is fully scrubbed from a KYC perspective. Um, and yeah, we find that it's a, it's, a, it's a niche at the moment that is in desperate need on island. And uh, yeah, happy to chat about that further. Got another question up here. Yeah, speaking more specifically to the voting process of a DAO, um, not all members are going to have the required knowledge uh, for specific decisions. So I was just wondering, like, how do you think a DAO could navigate the more kind of legal or technical or economic decisions and keep, it, keep the, ver the vote fair? That's not necessarily a Cayman Law question. It's a good question. I'm probably the wrong person to give you any thoughts on that because we do the structuring and the relationship between the DAO and the foundation, but in terms of the DAO governance and bylaws and voting and all that stuff, that's not necessarily going to be something the structure or even the Cayman lawyers are involved in. So I'm going to defer to these three gentlemen for thoughts. I think, as I mentioned before, quadratic voting uh, would actually solve that issue. Uh, I think that's the answer you're looking for. Could you get to a point where it's such a technical question that only five people know what um, they're talking about? No, no, we we mentioned it earlier. We mentioned it earlier, but but I think if if you use it as an example from a voting rights perspective in law, I guess it's um, your vote counts more in comparison to somebody else's that uh, has more shares, for example. So so that's why quadratic voting actually works. I guess we can have like rights that are swapped. Yeah, yeah, which. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so for example, you have a council of seven people, which in that sense would, would that, that'd be a sub vote. So, and on the council of those seven people, the Spartan council, as I was mentioning about uh, synthetics, um, each person would have the expertise relevant if it's, you know, equivalent of a chief uh, financial officer, chief risk officer, et cetera, all the officers all the chiefs, and, and therefore you, 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 you have a more of a democratic vote because this, uh, to Oliver's point about some DAOs would be voting for uh, illegal, illegal things or uh, you know, funding regimes that are under sanctions like North Korea, for example. So that's why you know, at times you actually have to have leadership uh, otherwise, there's a power vacuum, and it actually doesn't work. So. Yeah, you have to have that filter, basically. Yeah, yeah. 
that's incredibly important. Um, and there's another way of doing it as well, which is there's a very well-known DAO which has pods, and they'll vote in those pods in silos in terms of what their specialist areas are as well, rather than having a council. Ali, question for you and the rest of the group. When it comes to the voting, the members, do you typically need, a, is it a majority? Is it unanimous? Is it a quorum? How does that work? Majority normally, I would say. But um, yeah, it's, um, but it, it varies between, it between the different DAOs. Yeah, and the DAO can set its, its own it's, rules as the voting? They, they all have their own rules, yeah. Yeah. OK. So yeah. You're doing it as well. It depends. <laughs> Just a question on, on the subjects. With weighted voting and also councils, doesn't that give rise to the risk of shadow directorships and you know control being limited in the hand? You're essentially centralizing some that's decentralized and then therefore making a risk that actually the company's been controlled by shadow directors. Yeah, I mean, I mean at times through the democratic voting um, that those council members are chosen by, by those that are participating in the DAO. Yeah. So, and I mean, Obviously, sometimes it doesn't work. You know, you look at uh, the UK, for example, with Boris Johnson. Thank God he's out. But you know, <laughs> but now we have Liz Truss, which you know that that wasn't a public vote. That was that was an inner cabinet vote, which is worse than it was before. So I completely understand where you're coming from. And uh, no, but in those in those instances, it's more the transparency side of things is important. And uh, obviously, if those are participating in the DAO. Uh, uh, not agreeing with what the council members are doing, uh, the vote can be recasted uh, again and again. I think, I think following along that, you know, what if some members went rogue and now they started to come up with some nefarious positions? You know, is that a potential issue? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, and that's why you need blockers in place. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But, but I think anything significant, yeah, yeah, anything that's significant, if let's say if it's an investment DAO, and it could have uh, an influence on what is done with the money. Obviously, that's taken into account. So it's not just that the council or, you know, if this rogue uh, agents, if something goes wrong, like it's, it's taken care of in that sense. Okay. Final comment picking up on that is if you read the SEC's report on the DAO, one of the points they pick up on is the ability for certain people to effectively whitelist or block proposals, and they picked up on that. So the final question there is you have blockers in place, but then how decentralized is it? All right, question from in streaming. Chat, we have local man, and he says, um, how do insurance companies prevent fraud in DAO claims with hackers being prominent in the space? I'm sorry, just one more time. How You're cutting in and out. Sure. Sorry. How do insurance companies prevent fraud in DAO claims with hackers being prominent in this space? Great question. Um, but I'm going to go to the source. Joseph? <laughs> uh, this is the man who's conducting due diligence on that exact question. So, Joseph? But I, I mean, a lot of it comes down to, um, you know, the scope of coverage that is ultimately being provided. If... Um, you know, the foundation that we're providing coverage to is not responsible for the cybersecurity of, you know, a particular aspect of the protocol's operations, then, um, you know, it could fall outside of something that would be contemplated for coverage. But, you know, if we're underwriting a foundation that's been tasked with key security or that's been tasked with um, providing governance over treasury, the resiliency and the cybersecurity and the means by which they provide key security and, and enforce signing authority, those are all components of the underwriting process. But it comes down to understanding the facts and circumstances of each one of these particular underwriting initiatives and then you know, peeling back the onion to the point where you can make an informed decision. And I can tell you from personal experience that Joe and Realm have declined to offer some companies terms because their internal security controls were not up to speed. They were lacking. Uh, so, so, so you have that. Now, is there any question from home? Uh, I think maybe one more. Is there anyone else? Question? Eddie. Uh, 
Thanks, Wes. So we've spoken about a few scenarios where you can have bad players, and there's been a recent example with, with what happened with Tribe, where they were, went through numerous votes, and the votes changed, even though they were very overwhelming in one way or other. How can DAOs build in a mechanism that that doesn't happen in the future, because it takes away from the whole decentralization idea, and you can also get a few bad actors coming together and changing something that other people have already voted to happen a certain way. I will save, Thanks, Eddie. save the hard um, one for last. <laughs> you're, and is it specifically, Eddie, that you're saying, how do you prevent a revote effectively on the same issue? Or do you, is it more general than that? In yeah, terms I of mean, is there something that can be put in place to stop that kind of bad actor? scenario happening or maybe it's as simple as once something's been voted on once it's done Some sort of arbitration process maybe? potentially I, I mean that but that is exactly why we have the concept of councils either at the filter level before it gets to the vote to say no we've done that before guys that doesn't make any sense or we do it afterwards so it's been voted on and they go well okay it's passed but we don't need to implement it and so is it something that happens via the bylaws of a foundation yeah, that's or? exactly right that would be in the bylaws which are generally available online so that everyone can see the governing structure around how the votes take place yeah any other ideas around how you would prevent that a long time ago well i say a long time ago a few years ago Smart contract dispute resolution was um, something being heavily explored, and one of the ideas was uh, arbitration through either pre-nominated arbitrators or an arbitrator who was able to be nominated and then would have certain powers to pass decisions which could then be enforced by a smart contract, and that could extend to ruling on decisions around uh, voting, for example, or disputes around voting. Then you might have tiered appeals within that, and then the arbitrator has a final say. S nice idea hasn't really been tested yet, and even if that was tested, could that then itself be challenged by going to the traditional courts? We don't know. There's a lot of good ideas being floated around around this particular point, as in how many layers of protection do you have if things really, really, really go wrong and the whole thing falls out? I haven't seen anything yet that's either got it right or had it tested, and I'm not aware of any court that's actually looked at this. I kind of feel sorry for the judge who will eventually have to look at this. It might not even be relating to the mechanics or nuances of the governance might be just be a simple civil dispute. We don't know. So it's a very good point. I think there's lots of different ways of looking at it. It's an ongoing discussion within these communities, but it's the solutions and, and options have been going around for years and um, we haven't seen anything emerge yet that's been tested and is, is, is like market. And we haven't got a standard set of bylaws yet and a standard set of m and across the industry. Uh, and that would be the first step is to really build out kind of vanilla set of both that we always start with, and then we can make tweaks. And we certainly haven't got any governing statute around it, and that might be the next step after that, is to say that will fill in the gap. So where there's you know, plain vanilla m and and plain vanilla bylaws, actually we've got more comprehensive statute, or at least that would cover it where you don't even have bylaws. Because some of these DAOs don't have bylaws at the moment, which is leaving you completely exposed. Although autonomous, they're self-governing. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, From the technical perspective, Sorry, from the technical perspective, uh, I think because the DAO concept is fairly new, you know, 2016, I guess, uh, there hasn't been that much excitement from the technical development side. So obviously, like, it will catch up, and I think there'll be a solution. If it won't be a legal solution, it'll be a technical solution. Because I guess from a philosoph philosophical perspective, it needs to happen in order to... Uh, make sure there's justice, even if it's not a legal remedy. It'll be, I guess, well, a remedy in equity, but not really in technical side of things, I guess. Yeah. I just want to say thank you for sitting through an hour and 20 minutes of straight talk about DAOs. <laughs> yeah, I think that that is a very good point. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. I uh, want to give Caitlin a moment to speak here, who has put this entire event together. So thank you very much. Caitlin, but also you guys, I think everyone can agree this was pretty great. Most questions went answered, I think, pretty much. Um, like I said, these are some of the smartest smartest guys in the room right now. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Round of applause for our speakers, please.
Thank you. On behalf of Cayman Enterprise City, thank you all for coming and um, bearing with the rain to get here. It's been a great discussion, lots to think about, lots to take home, lots to learn. Um, I am responsible for organizing a series of Tech Talk events. This is our 40th event so far that CEC has taken the lead on. If you have any topic ideas, I know this is tech rich in this environment here, so if you have any ideas, please do come chat with me afterwards. I'd love to hear. We're curating a program for 2023. So any ideas, please come see me. Again, thank you to our sponsors, Stepping Stones, Blockchain Association, Digital Cayman, Cayman Enterprise City, KPMG for hosting the venue, and Kirk ISS for doing the live feed. So thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks. Everyone, uh, drinks over here. Please come down and ask Mark some questions. He will say it depends. <laughs>